So my friends, this Sunday, once again, we hear from the discourse of St. Peter on the morning of Pentecost. It's the morning of our Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and the Blessed Mother. But the scripture tells us that this happened on the Jewish feast of Pentecost. So it's two Pentecosts uh, in one. Got to make this official here. Um, and the Acts of the Apostle tells us that Jerusalem was full of pilgrims from all over the world of that time. So all over the Mediterranean basin from Mesopotamia, what's now Iraq, Jerusalem was full of devout Jews on the day of Pentecost when Peter speaks as he does today, full of the Holy Spirit. It reminds us of that word in the second chapter of the book of the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That prophecy is fulfilled on the day that Peter spoke these words. And what we understand in that is that as the Lord's spirit is poured upon all flesh, the law becomes ours. So for the Jewish people, the law was the most precious thing they had, the Ten Commandments, the, the, the guide. And as the spirit is poured upon all flesh, the law lives in our hearts, which is another way of saying that through Jesus and with Jesus and in Jesus, we know what's right and we love what's right. We know what we should do and we do it. Not because it's written on a piece of paper, but because it's inscribed in our hearts. I love what is right. So today in the first reading, that's the morning of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, before I lose all of you, none of us completely knows what is right. It's still a question mark for many of us. And at least speaking for myself, I do not completely love what is right. I still love things in a disordered way, which I think is where most of us are. We're on the journey of coming to know the right and the good and to love the right and the good. But that's what the gospel is calling us to today on Good Shepherd Sunday. I want to go back to that crowd of Jews in Jerusalem listening to Peter talk about Jesus. Uh, the moment comes when they say, well, then what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. And 300, 3,000 are baptized that day. There are a couple things that that crowd took for granted that we don't always take for granted anymore. So I think it's important to revisit those things to understand why they responded with such, such fervor so viscerally. Number one, they understood that the brokenness of the world is not God's work. They understood in the depths of their being that God had created a paradise, a garden. The brokenness of the world is not God's fault or God's work. They also understood at a very deep level that the brokenness of the world is not their problem. If they didn't understand that, they wouldn't have responded so viscerally to Peter's message about Jesus being constituted Christ and Lord. Jesus, whom you crucified, Peter says. They didn't respond, what do you mean? I was in Libya. I was back home in Iraq. I was in Turkey when that happened. They didn't say that. They understood that 
the brokenness of the world, I, I own it. I'm a sinner, and I understand that this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was made for me, not for them only, but for me. A tremendous sense of liberty, of being freed from under the weight of responsibility for the brokenness of the world. The Jews who understood that, who, who heard Peter on the morning of Pentecost, understood that. And it was coming from this sense of responsibility for the brokenness of the world. 3,000 were baptized because they understood that Christ was sacrificed in satisfaction for their sins. So, in the first letter of St. Peter, which is from the second reading, Peter says, if you are patient when you suffer for doing what is good, this is a grace before God. The entire world is working on its patience right now. It's a beautiful day in Chicago, and the streets are full of people who have been patiently waiting uh, for the all clear to sound, and it hasn't yet. We have to continue being patient if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, because this, this becoming like Christ, our brother, it happens at our baptism like it did for those 3,000, but it's also a process. And there are lots of falling down and picking, being picked up uh, along that road. So St. Peter is saying to the people in today's second reading, not that suffering is a grace, because suffering doesn't come from God. God didn't make a broken world. He doesn't give us broken things. But to act like Jesus in the midst of suffering, to be patient, to be hopeful, to be joyful even in the midst of suffering is a huge grace that the Lord wants to give us every day. Suffering either makes you a saint or it makes you a monster. And the gospel this is, the, this is the thing that we need to understand if our faith is really going to get us in our guts. The gospel, through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, it offers us the opportunity to become saints precisely through the suffering that is unavoidable in this life. We don't have to go looking for it. It will find us. But through Jesus and with Jesus and in Jesus, it can make us holy. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. Three of the readings today talk about sheep, talk about shepherds. You know, for the people listening to St. Peter, for the people that followed Jesus through Galilee and through Judea, sheep were the treasure of an, uh, a shepherding people in that economy. And yet, when the Lord describes himself as a shepherd, he's not doing so because of the ability of those sheep to care for themselves. This treasure isn't a treasure because um, because they're autonomous, because, because they're able to look after themselves. He's the good shepherd because they're vulnerable and vulnerable to problems of their own making. Uh, and this kind of trust, this radical trust in a God that we can't see and whose voice we don't hear the way we hear each other's voice, a radical trust in the, in the, in the voice and in the presence of a Lord and Savior and Shepherd uh, who is still with us, that is what is so difficult for us, uh, a highly educated, 
highly accomplished society such as ours. We like to think we can do it for ourselves. And it's not new. The Pharisees that don't understand Jesus in today's gospel, that's exactly what they thought. That I can do this myself. I can save myself. I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Well, if you think you can do that, you don't need the good shepherd. You don't need the one who looks at you like a treasure, who needs to be shepherded, who needs to be defended, who is vulnerable and who needs to be uh, fenced, not to keep you in, but to keep them out. The, the dangers of the world, the, the dangers to the spiritual life. You know, the, the sort of spiritual laziness that ends, leaves us just feeling kind of meh. I'm tired. I don't really believe in the victory of good over evil. I don't believe in the victory of hope over despair. I don't believe uh, in heaven, in the kingdom of God. Jesus, our good shepherd, wants to protect us precisely from that, from the cynicism, from the negativity that sin causes in all of our hearts because of our responsibility for the brokenness of the world. On Good Shepherd Sunday, we pray throughout the entire church for vocations to the priesthood and the religious life, but especially to the priesthood. You have a wonderful community here at Our Lady of Mercy. You have Alan, who is very close to his own ordination as a deacon. You have Alfredo and Juan Carlos, who are also preparing for the diaconate. You have Conrad and Andres, who are discerning a vocation to the priesthood. I hope that everybody at Our Lady of Mercy knows about these men. And I hope that everybody at Our Lady of Mercy and anybody else who might be listening to us this morning is praying on your knees for vocations and also encouraging men and women who you think might be called by God to serve the Lord in this way, to encourage them and to pray for them. Vocations come from families like yours. And it's the encouragement of those nearest to a young man or a young woman, which sometimes makes the difference between saying yes and saying no. I can tell you from my own experience that there is no vocation more beautiful or more rewarding than that of being a priest. For 25 and a half years, I have experienced that. Uh, and I am very grateful to God and to all those who love me and who have supported me in my vocation to the priesthood. And it's a time also to to pray not only for new vocations, but for uh, those who already serve the church uh, as deacons and as priests. The Good Shepherd treats his flock as a treasure. It's his riches. Uh, the flock is his, his joy because he's a protector and a savior. Let us ask the Lord to help that truth to sink deeply into our hearts so that we can rejoice in the freedom that having such a protector, such a shepherd, affords us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.